This is Solo Travel Talk. Your solo travel advisor is Astrid Clements. What would you do with a real splurge of time for a solo travel adventure, like three weeks or even three months? Well, your solo travel advisor, Astrid Clements, talks on this episode of Solo Travel Talk about some of the practical considerations that go into longer trips. I'm producer Catherine O'Brien. Using the backdrop of New Orleans, Astrid gets into how to get ready for a longer trip of three weeks or three months. Here's Astrid. Some key things I want to make sure everybody thinks about when they're planning, constructing, and actually executing whatever type of trip they're doing. But this type of trip really requires a lot of planning and thought on how you want to spend your time and money to make it most memorable because you got enough time to do what you want to do. But a lot of times when that happens, when you haven't planned properly, you can waste time and then it kind of gets away with you and you spend a little bit more money than you want or whatever. I was thinking with the three hours, you're so focused because you're like, I only have three hours. And you're right. You could get into a trap where you're thinking, oh, I have three weeks. And it could go by in a snap if you're not really focused. Absolutely. So the first question you really have to ask yourself is back to one of the key pillars that I said. What are you in the mood for? I mean, when you're coming to a place and you're going to stay three weeks, you have to decide really what you're in the mood for. Are you in the mood for enrichment? Is this going to be a wellness experience? Do you want total adventure, food exploration, retail therapy? Some people go to just shop. (laughs) Or do you want to just escape to a place that's new, exotic, that you've never been before and that's on your bucket list? Is it a sacred place or whatever you've always wanted to do, whether it's a pyramids? Like I always wanted a couple of years ago, uh, well, I've wanted to do this since I've really started getting involved in understanding the world and culture and travel. It was to go to Egypt and see the pyramids and take a cruise down the Nile. I mean, Cleopatra is one of my all-time favorite women, so... It's important to decide what you're in the mood for to do three weeks or what you need. Okay, so that's a key question you need to ask yourself first. Then you determine where you want to go. Okay, after that, get into, like I said, the pre-trip research. But this you got to really get into. And you start writing everything down, etc. Make a roughly week itinerary that is flexible but also gives you some focus and you construct this itinerary based on daily zones or uh, activities you want to do in a particular area don't do too much like usually i think two things in the morning one two things in the afternoon with a midday break say at around three for some gelato or coffee or whatever, and then back to your hotel and relax a little bit and then something at night to round out the day. So you need to kind of think about how am I going to plan this and get this to flow right. Next thing, like I said, when to go if you have the option. Sometimes you have to travel during the summer, but the best time to go and not the best time to go like I talked about, the high-low season, the weather-related things, etc. Then you got to develop that budget, that bad word. But when you stay three weeks at a place, that's when you can really blow some money because you might really get into a lot of different things and say, oh, I'll never be here again. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this. And then after you've spent, (laughs) oh, yeah, you spent thousands more than you thought. Okay. So, Catherine, back to New Orleans. This is how I would plan a three-week trip to the Crescent City. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole big itinerary, but I'm going to give you how I would tackle three weeks to make the most out of New Orleans or any other place, to tell you the truth. Now, New Orleans, I touched on this, and everybody knows about how devastated New Orleans was after 
Hurricane Katrina. And let me tell you something. I mean, the pictures really didn't show it all because the people's spirit. I mean, I know so many people who got sick from it and had very severe emotional issues. It was something that is very hard to even understand. And the people, the New Orleanians, they fought back. After they got basically their second win, they decided they are not leaving New Orleans because there's nothing like New Orleans. So the city leaders were determined to bring the city back, to preserve its traditions and its architecture and its food and its culture, but also to reinvent what they called the new New Orleans. So it would have a modern and vibrant vibe and have a real future. So the people that are making New Orleans go, they're preserving the traditions, but it's really cool. And there's so many people now that are moving to New Orleans because it has it all. It is really a happening place. With the tourism leaders or the people involved with tourism and tourist experience and make people want to come back to New Orleans after all of that, they came up with a really innovative campaign called Follow Your NOLA. And the whole thought behind it was instead of just coming to New Orleans and drinking and eating and having a good time, they want you to focus or what they call on pick your passion. And what this pick your passion is all about is New Orleans has everything there. Well, I shouldn't say that. They don't have mountains, beaches, or deserts, but everything else. And I mean, on a very high quality whether your passion is the arts, music, gardens, food, architecture, literature, whatever it is, really New Orleans has it. So the idea behind Follow Your NOLA and Pick Your Passion is to explore your passion while you're getting to know the city. So sprinkle your activities with your must-dos in your sightseeing adventures with what your passion is about. And to do these activities, explore them in the different neighborhoods. Just kind of like I was telling you about the playing your zones, you will find your passion in the French Quarter. You'll find your passion in the warehouse district. You'll find it in the garden district uptown and on Magazine Street. Also, in Marigny and the Bywater now, all of those things, they're evolving in those areas. And then don't forget about the side trips. We've got all these plantation lore and these gorgeous plantations that you can go and experience different elements of what makes New Orleans thrive because the plantation owners would farm and do all the agricultural stuff and then come in for the social season into New Orleans. And from like November until after Mardi Gras, Ash Wednesday, I mean, they it was a social season. So you've got all of these different areas, and they have wonderful things that would suit your fancy, i.e. your passion, as well as the must things to do. So you want to think about New Orleans like that to really get in the flow, or as they say, follow your NOLA. Don't just come and start doing. Do what touches you, because it's there in New Orleans. Of course, your accommodations, very, very key. If you're going to stay there three weeks, you have to be centrally located. You're probably going to do Airbnb, because it's less expensive. You'll be able to cook, but you've got to be centrally located, which I suggest either the warehouse district Or actually, the French Quarter is good, too, obviously. But the units there, I don't think, are quite as nice because some of those buildings are so old. And some of the people who haven't sold, who don't live there or they have their own condo, they tend to be like upstairs and former attics and that kind of thing. It's kind of uh, uh, creepy. But Warehouse District is really good because a lot of 
The interiors are rebuilt, and it's close to Canal Street, the French Quarter. You can walk. You can catch the streetcar, which is really important. You want to be able to catch that streetcar to be able to walk to places, or if you can't walk, to catch the streetcar, which will take you down into the Garden District, etc. I mean, and there's so many things you can do branching out from there. So very important where you are and you can also be in the garden district and they have nice places there but be close to that streetcar very important okay like i said i'm not going to go into a specific itinerary because the show would go on for another (laughs) we would be here for four hours because oh lord but this is how i would suggest you organize the trip to follow your nola and to experience the culture, and to really make it something like a grand three weeks. Organize each week kind of focused on a particular passion that you have. Say you love food. Week one, cooking class. They have those cocktail classes. Target some restaurants. They have a food and beverage museum. Kind of focus on the food aspect of it and before you go, what you want to get from it, okay, in terms of food. Then the second week, you could focus on art. If you like art, I've mentioned the New Orleans Museum of Art, Contemporary Art Museum, Ogden's Museum of the South, then all those galleries. I mean, New Orleans has so many art galleries, whether it's on Julia Street in the Warehouse District, along Magazine as well as in the French Quarter. So uh, three weeks is not enough time to go to all the art galleries. And then the next week, maybe you get into the gardens. I keep talking about gardens, and a lot of people don't do gardening, but they do appreciate beautiful landscapes and gardens. I mean, people are becoming more and more in tune again with nature because I think we're all bombarded by so much technology. We just need the comfort of nature. Well, in New Orleans, it is so warm and sultry that the gardens are gorgeous. The nature in New Orleans is gorgeous. So if you like gardening or you are attracted to that, they have this beautiful place called Longview Gardens. It's in New Orleans, but you have to take a cab there. But it was the Sears department store heiress. It was her beautiful mansion in her gardens right by the New Orleans Country Club. It's gorgeous. I mean, it's so beautiful out there, and her home is out there. Then you've got the French Quarter. They have tours of courtyards and mansions and how they do the specific gardening and that. They're fabulous. Those tours are fabulous. I've taken several of those. Oh, yeah, as well as in the Garden District. Now, that's a whole different (laughs) other type of gardening and plants and flowers and trees and how they incorporate living indoor and outdoor and that kind of thing. Also, you've got Audubon Park, which is spectacular. This is a gorgeous park for walking. I mean, just being in Audubon Park. The zoo is fantastic. It's not just for kids because it's really zoological too. I mean, not zoological, but horticulture. I think I forgot what they call it, but they get a lot of money from other sources to develop the flora and fauna and everything. They actually have a swamp in there. They have all kinds of things. You don't have to have your kids just to be, and you can eat in there and that kind of thing. They also have a labyrinth. They have two labyrinths, if you like to do that, walk the labyrinths. They did that after Katrina as a healing experience for people who live there as well as visitors. Then you have those plantation tours that I talked about, and actually the swamp tours. That's not gardening, but it's a lot of nature. (laughs) Uh, And then you sprinkle it with all the other things you want to do, the shopping that you want to do, where you want to eat, this kind of thing. So if you really do your research, you plan it out, you plan it in zones, and then you decide what your focus will want to be, it's great. You'll have enough time to do the history tour in the French Quarter and the ghost tours and get into voodoo, go down the streetcar. I mean, you could do all of that. That's the way I like to do anyway with three weeks. You do what you like and what you should do, 
that's how you do it, in my opinion. But then also you got to allow yourself, like I said, some downtime. You have three weeks, so you can't be all downtime. <laughs> But you really do want downtime where you people watch, you reflect. Like I like to do every day in the afternoon for an hour, maybe have a cup of coffee or whatever. And I I like to write in a journal. I mean, some people don't do that. But I love to document the activities and the things I've been thinking about or what I saw today, which actually led to my blog Mm. and then to my website and Mm. now this podcast all this reflecting (laughs) (laughs) but it's great I mean it is part of a good trip you can't just stay busy all the time and not think about or listen to your thoughts and also make sure you take a lot of photos Oh. oh I mean I know I'm getting a little loud but I love New Orleans so much I mean it's a great way to document your trip And it's a memory log. And what you will find is with your photos, you'll look at your photos two, three years from now, and you will see things in there you didn't see when you took them. You'll remember where you were, et cetera, most of the time. But you will see, oh, oh, look at those cool boots that lady had on or whatever. I mean, maybe not something that trite. But you will see more into the photo than when you took the photo. And it's really cool how that works. As well as you'll have something to share with your family, your friends. That's all part of it. So from my experience, three weeks is just the right amount of time to delve deep into a place's essence. Enough time to do everything you want, do all the things or must-do list, and give you enough downtime to really absorb the place. Plus... Usually at the three-week period, you are ready to go home. You're ready to sleep in your own bed, to see your family and friends, your pets again. Real life beckons. That is usually when everybody hits the what I call the brick wall. Just a couple of key things to consider for three weeks is what are you in the mood for? Pick your passion. Pre-trip research and planning and develop that budget. All right. Trip of a lifetime, three months. Now, you've actually done this kind of travel, so I'm really interested to hear how this longer term is going to influence your advice for our listeners. Okay. Well, this, this type of trip is definitely the big kahuna. It is your trip of your lifetime. Most people don't go off for three months More than once. They might do it a couple of times. But it's just one of those things because it usually happens when people retire or they're going through a life-changing event, like they're getting ready to change a career or they're trying to make decisions in their life or they've just gone through a divorce and they're completely, I mean, their life has been shattered. They never saw this coming or they've lost a significant other. These types of trips usually are fostered by some deep desire, okay? So they're difficult. Three months trips are difficult. They're expensive and they require a tremendous amount of planning and budgeting. I mean, even if you're wealthy, so, and just being away from home that long, I'm telling you, you have to be in shape physically and mentally because it's very trying. But the flip side of it is it, this trip will be a highlight in your life and it will definitely be life changing. There is no doubt about it because you will completely immerse yourself somewhere else for so long that when you come back home, you just feel different. You've expanded your knowledge, your essence, your consciousness. So it's life-changing for sure. Now, the trip's focus usually is on an area, okay? Whether you want to do Europe for three months and deep dive into Europe or Asia or South America or, like I did, I went around the world. Now, that's the most challenging one. (laughs) 
because unless you're on a cruise or a tour. Right. But if you're doing a pure solo like I did it, I'm telling you, you got to plan. It's hard. It's fabulous. But it is a real, real challenge. So it can be great. But this can also be, here again, the type of trip that a three-month trip would look like. And then the last is you could go and stay one place for three months, like New York City, London, Paris, Shanghai, Singapore. I'd love to stay in all those places for three months. I could get into that flow in either one of those cities very easily. So once you decide the area of your focus, then you can just start developing your personal focus. Back to that pick your passion again. Whether it's food, do you want to really get into the different cuisines all over Asia? You do your research before and you decide how you're going to approach this and how you're going to learn about it when you're either traveling through Asia or you're living in Shanghai. You see what I'm saying? Then the time of year you go. When you take a trip like this, I mean, that is very important. First of all, on your budget. Because a place is typically a little less expensive when there are not as many people there in terms of tourism, etc. And that happens a lot of times when the weather is not as good. It's either too cold or whatever. Now, you do not want to go during violent weather times like hurricane season, monsoon season. Now you even have to worry about pollution. Like in Asia, Mm. oh, in winter, it's horrible. It's much better, or I found, in the spring, in the fall, than it is in the winter or the summer. And that can be really bad. Another thing during the time of year, do you want to go during special events? I mean, festivals, Christmas season, that might play a, a factor in when you want to go and really stay, okay? Then... I can't get into the pre-planning. I mean, extensive. All the hotels and flights and logistics you have to have, getting from the airport to the hotel, making sure you're safe, all these kinds of things. There's a lot involved when you are traveling for that long. And you have to have it organized. I usually put it in some kind of travel journal where I have everything. It's on my phone. I've made hard copies of it as well as it's in my travel journal. So I have everything. So if I lose this, that, or the other, lose my suitcase, lose my phone, (laughs) hopefully it's definitely in my journal, which is in my backpack or my purse. Okay. Your visas. uh, Some of those take time to get. And then you have to have your passport right. It has to be six months or two years before, and then six months your expiration can't be. I mean, there are a lot of different regulations for different countries that you have to make sure. And then your visas have to be proper, and that takes time at certain places, certain embassies. You have to look at your health concerns when you're abroad. What do you need? Immunizations. You should definitely get a physical checkup, even a dental checkup. You need to prepare for all that. How am I going to have meds for if you take different meds for three months? All of that takes a lot. You should know a potential doctor's name, where the hospitals are. I mean, I know this sounds like overkill, but these are the things that if they go wrong, boo, make your ter- a trip go from great to something that is a nightmare. So you got to plan for all this. Then you need to, th- and this takes time rough draft of like weekly itineraries, Mm. key things you want to do, and then try to do it kind of by day. But you have to keep flexible and focused because sometimes you get lost in the moment and this, that, and the other happens. You can't do that. You got to reorient, change your mind. But at least you have it planned to a certain extent to keep you focused because Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of time. When you waste time, you waste money, and you waste happiness and experiences. Then, oh, the away-from-home to-dos are unbelievable because that's three months. Mm -hmm. So you really have to get people to pay your bills. Are you going to bring your pet on this three-week adventure, or who's going to take care of your pet? All these kinds of things need to really be done properly. 
For this long of a trip, you ought to start at least nine months ahead of time planning. I was just going to say, it takes like three times oh. the oh, amount yeah. of time you're going to be gone. Oh, yeah. You don't know. I mean, it is a lot to do. And then also your cell phone and the technology. Mm. Oh, my God. It's different in so many different places of the world. So you have to get all of that worked out, familiar with it, so you know when you have to turn data off and when the Verizon doesn't work where AT&T works and you got to get a SIM card. It's better to get a temporary phone here and then use your other one. Oh, my God. This technology thing drives me up a wall, and I'm really not that good at it. But you got to plan for it because otherwise you're just lost. You're a lost goose. <laughs> Dead. Okay. The budget. Oh, my God. Now, I suggest you go to my website and look at my budgeting blogs because it'll give you a whole budget and a worksheet and everything. You need to work through that because you need to know how much your total budget's going to be, how much your fixed expenses are going to be, your hotel, your flights, logistics, all that kind of stuff. Everything that you prepay or pre-spend. You subtract that from the total amount, and that's how much you have left over that you need to do for eating, touring, shopping, miscellaneous, something could go wrong, anything. And I even break it down on how much a day that I can spend when I'm there. So if I go over one day, I know i got to pull back in the next day or two to keep myself in line. So the budget part of it, you got to do that, in my opinion. I mean, you can say, oh, well, I have $50,000 and I'm going to make it work. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. If you don't budget, still, I guarantee you, oh, you will go over $50,000 usually, unless you just are real tight. You know what I'm saying? But at most people... What fun is that? Yeah, I know. When they want to do something like this, they let go of all inhibition. <laughs> okay. Then the packing. Oh, my God. That's another thing. Don't bring three suitcases. Get it down to at least two. And that's hard. I'm telling you, that's hard. Now, if you stay in one place, it's not quite as hard. But no, you can wear things more than once. No, you can get things clean. No, you can buy things. And I do a lot of talking about packing. And we always share our packing list at the end of all the podcasts. But I do some videos on my website that kind of helps you think about how to create a wardrobe and really what are the basis of lean and mean packing. Now, I'm not super lean. I mean, I must confess, I'm from Louisiana. We like to dress, but I'm getting much better with it. But I have got some key things that I think that these videos will illustrate to help people. Then the last thing is you got to get in shape. You need to be healthy for taking a trip like this or to stay away that long. I mean, if you're not, you won't have the energy, you won't feel as good, the trip won't be as good, and you could have some kind of health event because this is strenuous. This is what I'm saying. To be away from home this long is interesting and life-enriching, but it is strenuous. It is strenuous on levels that you don't realize. So think about it. You know, lots of people say, oh, I'd love to go around the world. Oh, that just sounds so great. And it is great. But let me tell you, on the other side of the great, it's hard. Just be prepared. Even if you go on the tours, the luxury tours, they only do them most of the flight-oriented tours. They don't go longer than 24 days because they know people hit the brick wall. It's too much. It's too much flying. It's too much new food. It's too much new culture. It's too much. So you got to really be prepared for all of that. Now, if you've been smitten with New Orleans and you want to, as we say in the South, sit a spell in the Big Easy, and really you've totally decided that you're going to immerse yourself in this lifestyle and live for three months in New Orleans. And all I can say is lucky you because yeah. you are really so many people, like I said, just fall totally madly in love with New Orleans. They're completely seduced. They buy condos. They come down here four or five times a year and stay for a week or two. But the city is so special and I know I've said this uh, earlier in the show, it's kind of like being in Europe. 
it has a real old world feel, but still American because there's so many strong cultural elements there. Big Irish population there. That I mean, the St. Patrick's Day parade and St. Patrick's Day festivities in that week in New Orleans is just like. I mean, it is unbelievable. And then you have the French, and then you have the Spanish. Lots of Jewish families from all over the world, big contingency. Lots of African-American population who originated from all over Africa and different places. And now Vietnamese and others. It is a gumbo of cultures all blended to make wonderful New Orleans culture. There's no other place like New Orleans. So to stay three months in New Orleans, lucky you. That's all I can say. Okay. Now, I'm not going to get into any kind of itineraries. I've talked enough about great things to do, how to think about it. But just some basics here again. First of all, your Airbnb. Either rent an apartment or do the Airbnb. You need to be positioned either in the warehouse district the French Quarter is okay, but it might not be the living space that you want and even be expensive. The Garden District is very good, but the main thing is you want to be close to that streetcar line because that is going to be your cheap, easy transportation. Now, if you're in the Warehouse District, there are pedicabs also, you know, all through the French Quarter, et cetera. Those are good too, uh, but you want to be able to walk, okay? Second thing. If you're coming to New Orleans, there is a time to come and a time not to come. If you do not like hot weather, do not come to New Orleans between May and October. It is so hot and humid. When you walk outside, you start sweating and your clothes can be drenched if you walk too long. It's like a steam bath. I mean, you'll notice it when you get off the plane. You go, oh my gosh. (laughs) So that really bothers you, don't come then. And it's not quite as much fun in New Orleans then, but they've still got a lot of things going on. So, I mean, if, if that's the only time you can come, don't not come. But I think the best three months is really the holiday season to Mardi Gras because that's when the city is most beautiful. And that's really, like I said, kind of the social season, the way it used to be in the plantation days where the planters would do all the agriculture and everything during the summer and the spring and the fall. And then in November, they would come into New Orleans, into their townhouses in the Garden District, and the balls would happen and the merriment would happen. You'd have Christmas and Revion, and then it would go into Mardi Gras and the balls and the presentations and all the parties. And then Ash Wednesday, they'd go back out to the plantation. Well, New Orleans still does kind of have that flow. So I think the best time to come, weather-wise, as well as fun-wise, is during Mardi Gras, especially if you've never been to a Mardi Gras. Oh, my gosh. There's nothing like Mardi Gras in the United States. I mean, they say it's the biggest party in the world. It's definitely the biggest party in the United States, and it's fun. Families are out there. Singles are out there. Couples are out there. Groups are out there. Everybody's having a good time. There's food trucks and the floats now, and the parades have just gotten better and better. I mean, it's just, it, it blows your mind how much people spend, how much money they spend on these things, you know? So it is a great time to be in New Orleans. Now, another good time is Jazz Fest. Mm. Now, that only goes on usually for three weeks to a month, and it can start getting hot. But if you love good music, I mean, they have the internationally the best people on all types of music at Jazz Fest. And what that does is during that time, it brings a lot of other musicians there before and after the fest. So that's a really good time to be in New Orleans too. But like I said, even if you have to come during the summer and that's it, there are festivals and Creole Tomato Festival. There are festivals almost every week in New Orleans. There is something going on. Then number three, like I said, pick your passion to follow your NOLA. There are a couple of great websites like NewOrleansOnline.com and a website called Where You At. But in New Orleans, they kind of have this Irish channel talk or whatever. Where you at? Where you at? 
<laughs> instead of where are you or <laughs> you know so so you kind of blend these words together but there's a lot of good stuff about art classes cooking classes photography lessons all kinds of things that you can do and join in that will help you focus and keep you focused through this three months so you'll be enriched you'll do things You'll have time to veg out, et cetera. But this is really good to help you visualize what your three months you want to accomplish. Then, of course, all those key neighborhoods, you'll be exploring them in depth. French Quarter, Warehouse District, Uptown, Garden District, Marigny, Bywater. And then also those side trips, like I told you, there's some beautiful plantations in plantation tours, there's also like swamp tours and bayou experiences. You can go down the mouth of the Mississippi River to the end. You know, there's all kinds of different things. But get lost in each neighborhood. You know, get in the flow because each neighborhood actually is unique. That's what's so really cool about New Orleans. All these different areas are unique and have a different feel. So eat there, drink there, shop there, people (laughs) there, people watch there, and just kind of, like I said, get in the flow. But one thing I want to stress enough, too, you have to know where the key bad areas are in all of the areas because New Orleans is weird about that. Even in the most ritzy sections, one block over, it'll be really a whole different deal. So you'll want to know where these key areas are and where you should not be. And then next is get into a routine, just like when you're at home. If you wake up at 8 o'clock every morning, wake up then. If you go to bed late, continue to do that. If you take your bath at night, do that. Get into a routine that will help you just be much more settled. And it does something. If you're too frazzled and everything is so new, you can't cope with it. So get yourself into a routine. Then Know or get your bearings. Know where the grocery store is. Know where the drugstore is. Know the neighborhood coffee shops or the local little neighborhood restaurants where you could just go in and get a sandwich or a po' boy or whatever. Get your bearings. Know where those are and where the church is. If you practice a religion, know where the church is and where the exercise. If you want to work out, know where you're going to work out two or three times a week, or if you're going to bike all the time or whatever, get your bearings and then figure out how you're going to utilize all that because that'll help you get in the flow. Then look for opportunities to make friends. They're friendly in New Orleans. They really are. But there are things like meetup groups. Now, you know, I don't typically do this, but there are a lot of people that do, especially younger people. And you can get on the website on the Internet and look up all these meetup groups. They've got a solo traveler meetup group that a girl that actually still blogs for me that conducts sometimes. There are all kinds of different meetup groups, you know, people who love food or whatever, that if you want to get involved with, you will meet people who are like-minded like you. So I suggest doing that. Then there are happy hours all over New Orleans. Now, you have to be a little careful, but if you go to the carousel bar or the courtyard at Brennan's and you don't have too many drinks at the <laughs> Columns Hotel, you're going to meet some people there if you're kind of open to it. And that's okay. Of course, you have to be careful, but you will start to meet people. And that's important. There's another place called Circle Bowl in New Orleans. It's a bowling alley, actually, now that people dance, they have music, and lots of people over 40 go single or couples or whatever. People love it. So seek out the places where you can meet people. Be careful. Don't get too friendly, but just feel your way through it. But try to make friends because People in New Orleans are friendly, and they are the type of people they keep their friendships. Another thing that I think is important is to dress appropriately in New Orleans. It's not as laid back in their dress code, I'd say, as a lot of international cities. People do tend to dress when they go out. They don't have to overdo it, but you'll get much better service if you dress. 
If you don't dress in New Orleans, you go, I mean, Galatoire's will not let you in without a man, without a jacket, and, you know, flip-flops are out and all that kind of stuff. You just have to know this when you come to New Orleans, and you'll get it once you, but be prepared for that and, and dress accordingly, I would say, in order to really experience things right and not get turned away at the door. <laughs> okay. Then be prepared to take lots of photos. And when I tell you lots, New Orleans is a photographer's dream for material, from the architecture to the people to the natural beauty. I mean, you'll take thousands upon thousands of photographs if you stay in New Orleans for three months. If you really like to take photographs, there's so much material. Like I said, it's a paradise. It's a photographer's paradise. The next is to prepare yourself mentally and emotionally. Mm-hmm. Now, whether you're going around the world or in New Orleans or one place for three months, I mean, when you stay away from home that long, it is difficult. Even if you're constantly busy and you're having a great time, I'm telling you, it is tough. It's tough emotionally and kind of psychologically on you that you don't realize until you do it, okay? You'll have highs and lows. There'll be some homesickness. And what I suggest when you get those feelings or those bouts, go to the spa. The Ritz has a great spa or the Roosevelt Hotel in New Orleans. But do something to pamper yourself or I mean, my weakness is the little retail therapy. (laughs) If I buy even a cheap couple of little bracelets, I think it looks so cute with my outfit. Oh, that's, you know, I'm I'm back on the road. (laughs) But just be prepared for that. And then also keep your communications going with your family and friends back home. Just checking in and all that kind of stuff. It's important to keep doing that when you're away from home that long. Because it's funny, it'll start working on your mind and your emotions. And then you say, well, do people really love me? And all these crazy things you'll be thinking about. (laughs) And you'll have to develop what I call a a happy alone skill. Because you will notice that. You'll say, oh, well, am I really happy? Why did I do this? I mean, you have to dig deep inside of that. And it's great. It's in your attitude, really. But... It does take some skill. You just have to keep calm and carry on. You'll be surprised when you get into those spots mentally and emotionally. But you will be, so be prepared for it. When you do, then take action, okay? Then the next, along that same line, is try to live in the moment. I mean, this is one of my husband's things he tells me all the time, especially when we first married, because I'd worry about this, I'd worry about that, the past, the future, today. Blah, blah. He said, Astrid, just live in the moment. Have your goals. Know what you want to do. Let go of what's happened in the past. But you're missing the day. <laughs> and he's so right. And it's kind of like a I don't want to say a Zen thing, but it's really how to be in the moment. And that's so important. It's part of that mindfulness that everybody's talking about now. But this is truly how you should be when you are gone from home that long, trying to absorb and experience a new place for whatever reasons you've traveled there. And this is a great skill to learn in terms of your own personal life at home. So strive to do that. The another thing is don't try to do too much in any given day. Oh my gosh, that ruins a lot. Give yourself enough downtime because if you get exhausted after a while or you get negative, then all these kind of weird stuff will creep in your brain or you might twist your ankle. You'll start getting that edge. You don't want to ever get the edge. You want to try to... Just be together every day. So don't let yourself, don't do too much. Then the last thing is journal. I highly recommend it, even if you've never done it. And there are a lot of people that don't like to write things down. They think, oh, what happens if people see what I wrote down? <laughs> or that's stupid, or I don't, I don't know, or oh, that's a secret. I mean, you ha- everybody has their reasons. But your recordation of this once-in-a-lifetime 
experience, especially, you know, like I'm talking about New Orleans, it'll be so valuable to you after the trip, to your family and friends, even while you're still living in the future. When you're not here, they will get to see where mom was and what did she do or whatever and how that changed her. Something you read in that might trigger exactly what you needed to know. It's wonderful, as well as it's a really good, I think, personal growth experience or exercise. And this is what a three-month travel trip will do. It is a personal growth experience, even if you're not trying to grow personally. You will. So you need to be cognizant of that. And I think it's wonderful to write it down because what I've found is when I write things down, they become more clear in my mind. And I've had quite a few aha moments or thoughts while I'm journaling away from home that I never, I wouldn't have gotten if I would have been trying to do it at home. It's just a real strange kind of thing that happens to your cognitive functions. So writing down, I think that's part of that cognitive function. But I'll end the show with, I do hope that you have enjoyed and learned from what I've shared with you on the show. It definitely was a fun exercise for me that I really haven't thought about in those terms. I mean, I'm a big planner all the time, and I'm very organized, and I fall back on that for a lot of reasons, for the reasons why I've told you, whether I don't want to waste money, I don't want to waste time, I want to know everything, etc. But if you have benefited from this time together, please share this episode with your friends and anyone else you think that this information will be helpful. And as they say in podcast world, like, share, and subscribe. And I'll say goodbye and thank you for listening. So whether you are traveling for just a short amount of time or the epic trip of a lifetime, guess what? Astrid gave a shout out to her packing list earlier. You have to pack for whatever travel you're going to be doing. So why don't you go over to her website, astridtravel.com. Right there on the homepage is an easy peasy way to get her packing list. It's totally comprehensive. It's going to help you be less stressed as you pack. I mean, that's really the whole point, right? Oh, I mean, (laughs) lugging around a suitcase with too many clothes in that you actually really didn't need, Mm -hmm. or you brought way too many shoes, or or too many tubes of lipstick, or whatever it is. You really do want to try to be lean and mean and to artfully pack. Lean, mean, traveling machine. you got to get her packing list. <laughs> Just go to her homepage, asktravel.com. Just put in your email address, and you'll be able to download that packing list right away. You know what we love? We love people who subscribe to this show. Not only does it help you, the listener, because you'll get the new episodes seamlessly, but it also pushes out the show to potential solo travelers. We love spreading this information. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. We want to hear about your teeny tiny adventure or your epic adventures. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next week on Solo Travel Talk. Thank you for listening to Solo Travel Talk. Follow Astrid on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. To learn more about Astrid or her solo travel advisors, visit her website, astridtravel.com. <laughs>